think Pink's party in the night? <laughs> Chicago, Miami? <laughs> well, an obese man in New York City this week is the first litigant to sign on to a class action suit against McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, and KFC, saying that the caloric content of their product is responsible for his overweight condition and his attendant diabetes and heart attacks. All right, listen to me, my friend, and uh, <laughs> believe me when I say I would have never said this had you not filed this lawsuit, because there's a certain unspoken etiquette in this culture, a, a decorum that prohibits people from being frank in issues like this. But, but now that you've started it, <laughs> the gloves are off, and I, I think for, I speak for the rest of the class when I tell you, you should stop eating so much, you fat fuck. <laughs> I know I've probably hurt your feelings, so haul your ass off the sofa for 30 seconds and <laughs> reward yourself with a couple double dongs. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've been pushed too far. It is unbelievable. Now that he's clogged his arteries, he's going to clog our justice system by suing the big four fast food giants. One lawsuit for each stomach. Why not? <laughs> Just bring a class action warm-up suit, Jabba. <laughs> Do us all a favor, you inadvertent Macy's balloon, and follow a restraining order against your appetite. <laughs> this country is going to hell in a handout basket because morons like you spend the first 40 years of your life growing your ass, and the last five, you expect us to save it for you. Well, I think I speak for the majority out here when I tell you we have had it up to here with you having it up to here, okay? <laughs> Just something to chew on, my friend. No, all right. Let's see what's new in the world this week. Expelled by his colleagues on Wednesday, Congressman James Traficant says he plans to run for re-election from his prison cell this fall. <laughs> Traficant says he'll run under the slogan, hey, I'm already here. <laughs> And former President Jimmy Carter has offered to mediate the labor dispute in Major League Baseball. However, Carter cautioned that since he's only sat in on negotiations with rapacious dictators sucking their countries dry, he might not be fully prepared for the level of greed he'll encounter in baseball. <laughs> the uh, city of Paris has closed off two miles of road and trucked in tons of sand to create a temporary beach along the River Seine. Yeah, because that's why I want to go to Paris, not the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, but Philippe in a cock sock made out of an eye patch and two Twizzlers. That's, that's, that's why I'm going to the City of Lights on my vacation. <laughs> Hundreds of dead squid have washed up on beaches along the San Diego coastline this week. What can I say? Sometimes my experiments go horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> And former Serb leader Slobodan Milosevic on trial for crimes against humanity complained of heart problems this week. Relax, Sloby, it's called a conscience. You'll get used to it. <laughs> on Monday, Greenpeace protesters leapt into the sea in front of two ships carrying nuclear waste off the Australian mainland. Way to go, guys. Nothing like trying to force cargo ships brimming with radioactive material to make dangerous lightning-fast maneuvers to raise awareness about the possibility of a cataclysmic incident. <laughs> And the National Urban League reported this week that blacks are making gains in the business world but continue to remain far be behind whites. In the interest of furthering equality, the group is planning a corporate scandal by a black-owned company later this year. <laughs> uh, despite, an, 
<laughs> Despite an appearance by the Pope, World Youth Day in Toronto is expected to draw a significantly smaller crowd than in previous years. See, the Pope can't draw like he used to. <laughs> they gotta send him out with a little bow-wow now. Because <laughs> the pontiff, be it right or wrong, is not thought to be street. <laughs> I got caught behind the Pope Mobile uh, once in a parade, and he had a bumper sticker on it that said, What would I do? <laughs> After filing the largest corporate bankruptcy in history, WorldCom stock closed at 14 cents on Monday, which leaves consumers with a dilemma to buy one share of WorldCom stock or two minutes of MCI long distance. <laughs> and. Uh, on Wednesday, Adelphia Communications founder John Regas and his two sons were arrested for looting $1 billion from the company. Wow. Is there anything more touching than the thought of a father and his boys serving quality time together? <laughs> you know, my cable provider is Adelphia. I wonder what channel Court TV is on. <laughs> you know, the good news is all, all this is that watching accused corporate crooks get dragged off in handcuffs persuaded investors on Wednesday to start buying stocks again. Hmm, interesting concept. Put these guys in stocks, and stocks go up. I, I say we arrest two a day until the Dow gets back above 10,000. <laughs> you know, it's, uh... It's been a tricky week on Wall Street, with the Dow Jones going up and down like the EKG of a burping hummingbird. Now, I don't want to get off on a rant here, but from WorldCom execs hiding losses like they were frozen three musketeer bars in Anna Nicole Smith's house to... <laughs> to... to Arthur Anderson shredding paper like Captain Hook rolling a joint, Americans... <laughs> Americans are finally putting corporate culture under the microscope, and they still can't see their investments. You know, as our government goes over the books from the past previous years, we are learning some new things. We're discovering that not only do the good times not last forever, but sometimes they never even existed in the first place. <laughs> One reason for the recent corporate scandals is that the late 90s boom years created a culture in which a company's head honchos could basically do whatever they wanted. They were their own moral compass. They could make their own rules, they could break their own rules, they could go as far outside the box as their restless spirits longed to soar. They were living in one non-stop SUV commercial. Now, <laughs> throughout the 80s and 90s, CEOs were treated like rock stars. Unfortunately, we've now reached the point on the Behind the Music CEO episode where the ominous voice says, but just then, Enron board member Vince Neal decided they needed to go out for more beer. <laughs> The democratization of the stock market, in some respects, has turned many workers into their own executioner. And don't even ask me what that sentence meant. Uh, but by having a 401k invested in the company they worked for, they ended up rooting for the stock to rise, even if it meant having to be laid off in order to accomplish that. Not only did they end up losing their jobs, they had to compliment their boss's business acumen for doing it. You can tell the difference between pre- and post-Enron corporate America, where previously annual reports were elaborate, richly colored multimedia presentations. Today, many corporations simply send out a one-page mimeograph of the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> Look. I've got no beef with people making money. What baffles me is how shocked everyone seems to be that all these CEOs were carrying on under the table deals. These guys are more adept under the table than Julie Christie in the movie Shampoo. <laughs> hey, if you were pulling in 10 figures a year and you started to see your dynasty crumble like a Ritz cracker in a Jiminy Glick's back pocket, wouldn't you cook the books at 451 degrees Fahrenheit? As a matter of fact, you don't even have to cook the books anymore. You just have to simmer them because in the present day working glass world of corporate accounting, red is the new black. There are exceptions, of course. The antithesis of the CEO as rock star has got to be Warren Buffett. Doesn't drive a fancy car, stays away from the hottest trends, invests in boring things like carpeting and insurance, sublimates any eccentric or flashy impulses by building a massive underground lair, staffed by genetically engineered meerkats who will one day rule the globe when mankind <laughs> destroys itself through nuclear war. <laughs> Come on, I can't be the only one who reads his annual reports all the way through. <laughs> I put all my money in Jimmy Buffett. I don't know how the stock's doing, but the shareholder meetings are an ass kicker. <laughs> now, as someone, 
Now, as someone who has lost two jobs this year, let me say I am not just jumping on the economic downturn bandwagon. I'm fucking driving it, okay? <laughs> but unfortunately, unfortunately, as our system stands, the one who always ends up shafted is the little guy, not the billionaire CEO. It's the 50-year veteran, the guy who started working at the foundry when it was just two steamy cramped rooms in someone's basement, but slowly inched his way up to assistant foreman through sheer elbow grease. Now he's 30 seconds away from retirement, the company's going bankrupt, and his pension fund is emptier than the stands at a Chumbawanga concert, <laughs> so he's got to get a second job bussing tables at one of those panda shit Chinese food joints. <laughs> so I don't want to see some CEO going to jail for three years at a minimum security prison that doubles as a community college during the day. I want them to witness the damage they caused up close. I think they should be sentenced to community service, sorting the shoe bin at a Goodwill in a low-income neighborhood to get a sense of how real people have to get by. Make Kenneth Lay work the drive through window at the Jack in the Box so I can literally hear that lying bastard's voice coming out of a clown's mouth. <laughs> Just, just don't. <laughs> just don't drive away without checking that you got everything you ordered. <laughs> what I'd actually like to see is these guys doing hard time in hard prison. See how they like it when we let the warden get creative with the books keeping track of their sentences. <laughs> you want to make sure this doesn't happen again? Put these losers in with the general prison population who are doing 10 to 20 for stealing a centilla of what these guys did. Then make sure there's a live Big Brother shower cam feed <laughs> into every other CEO's office in the country. You're going to think twice about cheating the numbers when you spot your ex-golf partner all lathered up with a wind chime hanging from his ass. <laughs> Of course, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. <laughs> I want to know what you think, America. Give me a call at 1-800-522-8673 because my guest is the man who showed us that even Mother Teresa wasn't always a saint, or so he says. Any cr I haven't believed she was. Any crooked CEO would find prison a welcome alternative to the punishment of his eviscerating pen. He's a best-selling author and contributing columnist for Vanity Fair, and his newest book, Why Orwell Matters, is due out in September. Please welcome one of our favorite guests, Christopher Hitchens. Christopher. Thank you. Not many guests have the pinstripe suit and the sandals on. <laughs> I'd rather do class war than orthopedics, but it's a very long story. It's a sad story. You shouldn't mock my uh, no, afflicted you look good. foot. You're an eclectic man, and you're dressed thusly. Now, um, now, by the way, who is that young presidential candidate who you've taken a shine to. It seemed like such an unhitchens-like article. What is it about that young man that you like so much? The senator from North Carolina. Yeah, Vanity Fair. What is his name his again? His name is John Edwards. He and should you're... probably get a more memorable name. Yeah, well, look. I don't mean to say I'm advising him on anything or anything like that, but he's, um, he's sort of the real thing. In what regard? Now, I find you to be a tough nut to crack. I admire your intellect, and I think you have great taste on most things. And it seemed to me that he Sweet would be the you. exact sort of guy who you might see through, like, two-day-old Neutrogena. What do you see in him that you like? Uh, the, the president is in uh, his own state today, uh, making a big attack on uh, medical malpractice on people who sue doctors and insurance companies and so on. And Edwards, who sued a lot of people um, for a lot of real malpractice, says, well, the president can have the insurance companies and I'll represent the victims. We, we don't, I don't mind if he does that. That's the bit I like about him. Um, if your daughter had been sucked into a drain, if she was four, sucked into a drain in a swimming pool and all her intestines pulled out, you'd be upset, I bet. And if you later found that the people who made that drain knew that it could do that to small girls and it had happened many, many times before and the change they needed to make in the drain would have cost them a dime, you'd be very, very upset. Well, he sued them all the way to the very end and at the end they said, well, what do you want? He said, well, what have you got? And he took it all away from them. I liked him for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I actually think now is probably a very good time to run that way. Because now we know that, um, you remember the old definition of the upper crust? What is that? A load of crumbs 
held together by dough. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I think, exhibiting yeah, itself. I think you could run against that crowd now. Yes. Though well, I live in Washington, as you know, and I can tell you what's going to happen. Well, lay it out for I me. I admire hear, your scenarios. I think your audience deserves nothing but the best, and the, they need to hear it first. There's going to be a full and frank and no holds barred inquiry into all this racketeering. And it's going to be chaired by the um, U.S. Congress of Catholic Bishops. <laughs> <laughs> the, the conquered out of erect yeah, worms, as it were, down in Dallas, Texas. Um, what, what, how much do you think, uh, and I know that a lot of the evidence seems circumstantial to me at best, how much of this is, can, can be laid at Bush's doorstop? Do you think this corporate uh, mindset... Do you think it comes, emanates from the fact that the president was formerly immersed in that world, or do you think he's just catching in a bad cycle in, in business right now? No, it's the only culture he knows. It's the, it's the way he became the owner of a baseball team. It's the way he became the owner of a company and then another company. It's the way he was bought out, and it's the way he bought in. It's the only, it's the only cultural thing that means anything to him. It's probably the only set of rules he understands. That's why I loved it when he said, um, well, it may only be 1% of the executives who are doing this. So how does he know that? I mean, if the president wants to reassure you and says, and he doesn't want to use the thing about, well, it's only the apple, not the barrel, mm -hmm. but because he knows people are wise to that now. He says, well, it's maybe only 1%. Well, how, at first, how does he know? And second, if the president is one of that 1%, that alters the odds, doesn't it, of anything being done? He is one of the 1%. Isn't Karl Rove savvy enough to tell the president at this point, though, that bodies have to be thrown out the door? Isn't he a savvy enough politician to know that if he is part of that 1%, he better make himself an exclusive member of that 1% club because the rest of them better be pounding rocks somewhere in uh, prison? That's what, that's what they'd like to do, but um, they still want your Social Security in the scheme and mine and everyone else's here. Aren't you glad? Um, that your Social Security didn't go into that. It was that close. They wanted everyone's money to be in. Uh, the, it's like with McDonald's. They, they wanted don't, to they, give you the option, they didn't they, They don't know Chris? where to stop. They can't rest. Wait, wait, before we go, yes. they wanted to give you the option of investing a portion of your money into the stock market out of your Social Security fund, right? It wasn't mandatory. It wasn't like they were going to make you step up the lines and no, fork it over. But it would be the camel's nose under the tent. In other words, everything would be... Uh, what the fuck it, does that I mean? <laughs> The camel's nose. Yeah, oh, well, the camel's nose? Yeah. Follow me closely here. Okay. It goes under the tent. You think, you pat it, stroke it, think, hey, it's, a, it's optional. And then the rest of the camel follows, of which there's a lot. <laughs> it's a, Is that I an old you, Ross Perot one? No, it's an old... Uh, <laughs> it's a... It's a metaphor. <laughs> I, I, I dwell in the world <laughs> metaphor. But, but, that one, no, but the know. president still says he thinks it would be a great idea if Social Security was in the market. And maybe now if everyone put all their money in, it would go up. But is that why you're not doing it, or is it why you are? Well, what, uh, do, you just, do you think he's flat out evil at the core? I'm always interested by no. people who think that Bush is... Uh, he doesn't seem evil to no, me not at, at the all. least. No, he's not. He's, he's, his eyes are so close together that he could use a monocle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's not, that isn't a sign of evil. Um, and, he doesn't, and he's not very, 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 very bright. But he doesn't... <laughs> But he doesn't believe he's bright. But the we great thing is, that, the he great thing is there, there are people who are stupid, um, and there are people. Uh, what you worry about is what they don't know, and then there are people who you worry about because of what they don't know that isn't true. For example, Jimmy Carter was much smarter than Mr. Bush, but a pretty shitty president. But a very right? bad president indeed, because he thought he was clever. He thought he was smart. That's very, very bad if people, if, when stupid and conceited people meet, or when you... <laughs> <laughs> that's the dangerous confluence that's when you of events. <laughs> feel for your social security, yes. Yeah. What do you feel would be a good signal to send to the American people vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, well, we saw the Regus family led away. I thought there was a very symbolic gesture, as, as Mike Barnacle kept reminding me, make them do the perp walk last night. Yes. Mike's always got that tough police blotter lingo, but obviously that was a symbolic gesture. What do you think they should do now to these men, though, instead of just making them walk in cameras? What, what sort of... Uh, punishment befits that crime. To go to jail, you'd have to have smoked the wrong kind of cigarette, say. Then they'd be on you, and you'd go away for a long time. That's what it takes to go to jail. What do you mean, smoking a joint? Wrong, wrong kind of cigarette, then you can go to prison. Um, for these people, it takes longer, because they can hire very good lawyers. I, there is no rich man's wing for any jail in the United States ever built. There's no one that rich has ever gone to the joint. 
for these people, it should be they take all their money away, I think. Make them give the money. Is the money even... That would get them, that would get them to give it back. Uh, well, that seems like do you know what the no statute, brainer. Is the money traceable? Do you know what the law says now about the statute of limitations? If you think you've been defrauded in the market, uh, you have to find out within a year. Now, a lot of people only found out after their money had already gone. They say, okay, you've got a year to get it back. And then off that statute, now, who wrote that law? I'd love to have been on the committee that wrote that law. That's what the law is like now. Uh, the law is like a cobweb. It's, it, it holds the weak. It doesn't, it's, too, it's too weak to catch the strong. So knowing that that's true, say, well, all right, first give, the, give all the money back, and then we'll, later on we'll have a trial mm -hmm. and find out whether you did wrong. What, what part of your nature, or, do you have a contrarian nature within you that uh, dictates that you live in this den of thieves? You're right in the middle of it in Washington, D.C. What, what attracts you to that? Uh, it's, it just seems like there, there must be so many people there that you find repugnant. What's the attraction for you it means, living there? It means I never get bored. <laughs> Plenty of targets. Yes, I never get bored. In fact, I'm nervous sitting here now in Los Angeles. So I think, if I turn my back for a second, if anyone turns there, if you look away, they're right in your pocket or in your flies or in your wallet. Or, or giving you an order for 13 cannot, on the air. Yeah, you can't, you can't neglect them for a moment. But no, but I love, I love it. I mean, who would want to be anywhere else? What, uh, what do you see happening in the midterm elections here? What would be your opinion? Do, do they rest back control of the... Uh, the Congress, the Republicans, and get some of their uh, judges appointed, or does Dashaway able to hold them off at the pass? Well, uh, the Democrats have been so imitative. They're so, they're so scared of Bush. They're so mesmerized. They watch him and then think what they should do to be more like him, that I think they won't be able to excite people in that way. But um, Bush hasn't noticed that. I mean, Bush is still willing to treat them as antagonists. And I think um, he's realized already he has no coattails. I, I know it's another cliche. It's a, it's a metaphor, by the way. The coattails. <laughs> coattails the coattails is, is, is a the, metaphor. The, the, like um, the camel on the pe humps. People who run, people who run as, yeah, people who run as Republicans don't get the vote that Bush's approval rating might suggest. It's like that. Right. Way. Now, do you think... And uh, the, the big party is still the people who don't vote. Let me ask you this. Your friend, uh, or you're not your friend, your acquaintance who you seem enamored of, Edwards, who I'll have yes. to scope out now because I'm intrigued by your interest in him, he decides to run and ask you for your help. Uh, in crafting some speeches and that. Would you do that on a back channel, or would you feel that would violate your journalistic uh, pedigree? It, well, let me just say, I think it would violate his chances of becoming the <laughs> next president. <laughs> so I think, More than it would violate I think, you know, yours. For, for, for both our sakes, I should probably say no. Yeah. Well, Chris, what's, uh, what's the uh, Orwell book about now? The Orwell book is about uh, my, my hero, um, who managed, uh, he only lived 46 years, and he only ever owned really a typewriter. And he never had a steady job. And he was always ill and he was always broke. And he wrote uh, four or five books that changed the whole world, or at least the way we think about it. And on the three great subjects of the 20th century, which were the end of empire, the defeat of Nazism, and the defeat of Stalinism, he was right. And everyone else was wrong. Well, uh, you should price, price your tome at 1984, and right. you'll have a good sales That's technique. It. Mr. Hitchens, it's always an interesting guest. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan got a sense of the national mood in the stock market this week when lawyers wheeled in a giant shit-covered fan. <laughs> Not helping the outcome of his bribery trial was the way Ohio Representative James Traficant kept making charts to show the jury what their cut would be if they got him off. <laughs> and here Traficant's hair hovers an inch above his skull, then zips off for a spin around the room on its own. <laughs> Despite making billions of dollars on software, amazingly, Bill Gates still does not know how to operate a computer. <laughs> Here, Vice President Cheney tries desperately to experience a vicarious bite of another man's greasy cheeseburger. <laughs> Just as Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was telling the press not to worry about an attack of 50-foot killer crayfish, to his horror, General Richard Myers saw one lurking right outside the window. <laughs> and German Chancellor Gerhard Schrader 
had heard the rumors that Polish President Kwasniewski would use his big, over-exaggerated laugh to get a look at his package. <laughs> I didn't even try to get that Polish name right. <laughs> now, yes, sir, remember, after you give them the number, you inform that for an additional 50 cents, you can dial it for them. <laughs> I'm going to strangle you, and I want you to let me. I'll explain later. Not handling his losses in the stock market well has been one-time leading man, Elliot Gold. <laughs> House Majority Leader Dick Armey felt he should explain when Representative Nancy Pelosi happened upon his sketchbook of headless nudes jumping rope. <laughs> Though no longer a paid spokesman for Viagra, former Senator Bob Dole now wanders the countryside alone, helping strangers with their boner troubles, and he moves on. <laughs> Rather than set up a lemonade stand like he did last summer, Robbie tapped into the county's power grid and began selling affordable electricity way below market cap. <laughs> Joey's sudden teenage growth spurt came in the middle of an overnight camping trip. <laughs> Bingo and Tran earned a nice living making sure nobody sped through the school zone. And finally, come on, Madden, it was Pat Buttram who played Mr. Haney on Green Acres. Shit, Miller would have known that. <laughs> Guess what, folks? That's the news. I'm out of here. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.